Good morning. I want to welcome you to our 2019 Grace A. Tanner Lecture in Human Values today. I am pleased to see that you're here and, and thank you for coming to this event. I'm Dr. Danielle Dabrowski, Director of the Tanner Center here at Southern Utah University. I just wanted to let you know that at 2.30 there will be an extended Q&A in the library Huntsman Reading Room, which is on the second floor of the library. So if you want to have more time to talk with Vijay Gupta after the lecture, he will be available 2.30 to 3.30 at the library. The Grace A. Tanner Center for Human Values was created through an endowment provided by the Tanner Center, the Tanner Trust for, U for Utah Universities by Obert C. Tanner, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Utah and the founder and former chairman of the O.C. Tanner Jewelry Company. The purpose of the trust was to provide for a lecture series at three Utah universities to which the Tanner family had close ties, the University of Utah, Utah State University, and Southern Utah University, then Southern Utah State College, where Grace Adams Tanner, Obert's beloved wife, had attended school. Ours is the only Tanner Center that is named after his wife, which is it is the Grace A. Tanner Center. At Southern Utah University, the Tanner Lecture was established as a function of the Grace A. Tanner Center. Obert C. Tanner was an educator, a professor of philosophy at the University of Utah, industrialist and philanthropist. Of all the gifts he left to the universities, the one he was proudest of is the Lecture on Human Values. The Tanner Lecture on Human Values was formally established at the University of Cambridge in 1978. In writing about the purpose of these lectures, Professor Tanner said, I see them simply as a search for a better understanding of human behavior and human values. To this end, the lecture provides a forum in which to promote scholarly and scientific learning in the field of human values while embracing moral, artistic, intellectual, and spiritual values, both individual and social, and advancing the full register of values pertinent to the human condition, interest, behavior, and aspiration. For the past few years, the Tanner Center has explored a different aspect of human values, and this year our theme is self, community, and, and human values. How do you define your community, and how do you give back to your community? In speaking with Vijay Gupta about this topic, it was clear that this line between self and community becomes blurred through his passion as a musician to use music as a healing art in his community. To quote him directly, artists and performers do not have a choice to not be engaged in social and civic discourse. It is as much our job to heal and inspire as it is to disrupt and provoke. It is our job to be the truth tellers of our time. Vijay Gupta joined the Los Angeles Philharmonic in 2007 at the age of 19 after having completed an undergraduate degree in biology from Marist College and a master's degree in violin performance from the Yale School of Music. Gupta has been named one of six National Citizen Artist Fellows by the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. He has performed as a recitalist, soloist, and chamber musician on an international scale since the age of eight. He serves on the faculty of the Longy Music School of Music of Bard, Col sorry, of Bard College Masters of Arts in Teaching program, which prepares musicians to become agents of change through the study of performance, music, pedagogy, and social justice. He also serves on the board of directors of the DC-based National Arts Advocacy Organization, American for the Arts, as well as the Los Angeles's beloved 24th Street Theater. He was presented with an honorary doctorate degree of humane letters by the University of Laverne. At the age of 29, he was awarded the Leonard Bernstein Lifetime Achievement Award for the Elevation of Music in Society from the Longy School of Music of Bard College. Just gonna quick, do a quick shout out because of our interest in community connection for the, our theme. We do, there is a, the Orchestra of Southern Utah will be presenting an event called Storytime Origins on October 10th, next week at 7.30 in the Heritage Center. Just wanted to put a shout out for that because of our connection with community. In regards to the, uh, all of the accolades that, that Vijay Gupta has received, he is a violinist, social justice advocate, and esteemed performer, communicator, and citizen artist. He is a leading advocate for the role of the arts and music to heal, inspire, provoke change, and foster social connection. Gupta is a founder and artistic director of Street Symphony, a nonprofit organization providing musical engagement, dialogue, and teaching artistry for homeless and incarcerated communities in Los Angeles. Recognized for his dedication to bringing beauty, respite, and purpose to all those too often ignored by, so by society while demonstrated the capacity of music to validate our shared humanity, Vijay Gupta is a 2018 John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellow. Please welcome Vijay Gupta. Thank you, Daniel. 
I so appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I greet you in the way of my ancestors by saying namaste, namaskar. Uh, and what namaste literally means in Sanskrit is that I bow to the divinity that is within you. Because the divinity that is within you is the same that is incarnated within me. And I'd like to play a piece of music for you now that actually no audience has ever heard before, and I hope you won't hold that against me. Uh, it's a piece of music written by um, an amazing composer based in LA named Rina Esmel. Uh, she also happens to be the love of my life. And she wrote this piece of music as we were kind of backing ourselves into a relationship with each other. Uh, kind of really trying to not acknowledge the fact that we had been in love with each other for years. Uh, and so as we were developing the title for this piece, we called it Darshan. And Darshan in Hindi or Sanskrit means vision. Um, but there's also another meaning in the sense that when you visit uh, a Hindu temple, uh, you want to have a darshan of God. So you actually want to see the divinity and see the incarnated or memorialized form of something sacred. And so in that, uh, I am so honored to offer you this piece of music. And I also want to say that so often um, in spaces like this, we operate behind the fourth wall. You know, we as professional classical musicians say, I did not sign up for human contact. Uh, but the truth is that this is a talk about human contact. This is a talk uh, about a mutual offering. And so the truth is you are giving me the greatest gift I could hope to receive, which is the greatest gift we can give anyone, which is our attention. And so uh, in this offering of music, uh, may we have this darshan, this vision together.
Thank you. What I love about that piece is that it's my first forays into playing my own music, uh, playing the music of my Hindustani culture. And in Hindustani music, music is written in ragas. And ragas often mean you know, scales, uh, feelings. But actually, raga comes from the Sanskrit word rang, which means color. And so the color, the emotional color, of this um, movement is in a rag called Charukeshi. And Charukeshi is a very old, ancient uh, raga. But what I love in this music is how deep and sometimes violent and painful it is, but how sweet it is as well. Um, and the kind of melting, continuously melting into sweetness over and over and over again, I think is an incredible metaphor for life that we hold grief and joy together as we kind of melt into sweetness. I'd like to start um, by quoting the, the Sufi poet Hafiz, uh, who speaks these incredible words through Daniel Ladinsky. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you do not do this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. <laughs> Still though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives in the full moon in each eye that is always saying, with that sweet moon language, what every other eye in this world is dying to hear. One of the very first memories I have of playing music was going into a place in downtown Manhattan called the Rusk Institute. Uh, it was a center for children with terminal cancers. And our music teacher, uh, actually my, my, my Suzuki violin teacher, took me in uh, to this center along with maybe 12 or 13 other young people. And I really don't know what she was thinking, um, but it must have been incredibly brilliant to, to connect us and connect our music making with the realities of life, to play for children who may not ever see the opportunity to become adults or ever see the opportunity to make music in their lives. But we were playing this piece and it must have been something from the early Suzuki books. So it must have been like a Vivaldi or a Bach or something. And this nine-year-old girl her, her head was bald and she was wrapped in a, in a sheet and she was lying on the, on the, I remember, the upper bunk bed and I must have been six or seven years old. Um, but when we started playing this music, she sat bolt upright in her bed and she started conducting us. And she was waving her hands back and forth like this. And there was such unabashed joy and sweetness and power in the way that she looked at us. And I've never, ever forgotten that look. I've never forgotten that feeling. Because for us as musicians, but as people, we are looking for that sweet moon language, the recognition and the darshan, the vision in every other person to be seen, to be heard, to be known, to belong. And so when I think about sweetness, I actually think about the stories of traditional singers in my native country of, of India, but specifically in Bengal. Uh, and the troubadours in that part of the world are called the Baul, B-A-U-L, Baul singers. And the Baul singers are incredible because they're wandering, they're part wandering monks, they're part Sufi mystics, they're part, um, Hindu practitioners of Tantra, they are monks who marry. Uh, they are every single contradiction. They worship Krishna and Allah in the same breath. And when someone is initiated into becoming a Baal singer, they, in, they are initiated through a practice called Madhukuri. And Madhu means honey, and Kuri is gathering. And so they literally make their music in an act of gathering sweetness. 
And what this really looks like is that these musicians, these mendicant beggars, go from home to home, often in the very poorest neighborhoods, and they sing their songs to get alms. They beg through their music. And it establishes and undoes this fourth wall. It establishes human connections where we as performers, as musicians, actually have to shed our veneers of expertise and professionalism and put ourselves at the mercy of our audiences. And I wonder what it would be like to think about that metaphor in the realm of Western classical music, but even beyond that in the realm of what it means to connect with each other as citizens. We live in a world in pain. We live in a world filled with distraction where we ache for our souls to catch up with the pace of our lives. And in this constant scroll culture, I think we've gotten lost in a pathology of speed and accomplishment where we've become human doings as opposed to human beings. We gauge our success based on what we do the letters at the end of our name, the letters we're hoping to get at the end of our name, the grade point averages, um, teaching for the test. And yet, in having deep experiences, we're also obsessed with sharing those experiences as quickly as possible through social media. And I think about um, the amazing poet Naira Wahid, who says, would you go to that country if you couldn't take your camera? What would it mean for us to actually not be craving the likes and the social media impressions, but rather be aching and working towards that sweet moon language, really truly seeing and acknowledging each other? What does it mean when the most terrifying thing that we can do in our day-to-day -day lives is to slow down and put our planes at airplane mode or disconnect? But more importantly, what does it mean to be terrified by the question of how it is we can be most authentic to ourselves? And so the, the stories I'd like to share with you today are not just about music and community and undoing the fourth wall, but truly about the nature of how we show up to the world around us. What does it mean to not have to convince anyone to become an artist or to go and serve your community through an act of charity, but truly show up for your own salvation and show up to establish that connection uh, with another human being. So I'd like to tell you a couple of stories about a community of people who I'm lucky enough to work with in downtown Los Angeles who live in a 50 square block area of one of the greatest cities in the world uh, and experience chronic homelessness and poverty. On any given night, up to 60,000 people experience chronic homelessness on the streets of downtown Los Angeles. And an overwhelming number of people in this community are poor people of color who have a severe mental health crisis. Uh, many individuals are veterans returning back home from war. Skid Row is also the drop-off point for people emerging from incarceration uh, anywhere across Los Angeles County. And in fact, there is a revolving door between being homeless in Skid Row and being incarcerated in the largest county jail system on the planet, which is our Los Angeles County jails. Our de facto treatment of mental illness in the United States is incarceration. And one of the Los Angeles County jails, specifically the Twin Towers Jail, warehouses up to 5,000 mentally ill individuals on any given night. Every year in Skid Row, um, a group of chaplains from the LA County um, Hospital collect and protect and watch vigil over the remains of people who have passed while homeless. And every year, uh, in the beginning of December, there is a ceremony held called the Burial of the Unclaimed. Um, every year, my organization, Street Symphony, offers some music to um, memorialize uh, the people who were lost while homeless. Um, but this is an incredibly heartbreaking ceremony because we think about what it means to be unclaimed. The title of this ceremony is the Burial of the Unclaimed. 
And this year already there have been 700 people who have passed while homeless in Skid Row. And yet this is a community where I go to learn. This is a community of poor people who, although stripped of basic human rights and dignity, have found a connection to their souls and their humanity, which reminds us, us classical musicians, musicians from jazz and reggae and mariachi traditions who are professional musicians and artists living and working in Los Angeles, that this work is not about performing and leaving, but this work is about connecting and staying. We'd like to cue up a, a video the first video of uh, my presentation today of a project that Street Symphony held in Skid Row called The Block Party. And um, The Block Party was held in conjunction with an organization called The Midnight Mission, which is uh, a rather well-known, renowned 12-step recovery shelter in Skid Row. And this is a beautiful celebration, so I hope you enjoy The Block Party. Today, we got the block party for three symphony that's going down. This is really for the community and by the community, and it should just be a jam, like a celebration. The lineup today is a mixture of community ensembles that are from Skid Row and perform in the Skid Row community, as well as many professional musicians from the LA area. We will have a lineup of six different acts, as well as a meal service, and we're expecting around 2,000 individual uh, participants. This will be my first time playing on the street with Street Symphony, which I'm most excited about. I think that is the most authentic act of engagement, saying like, we're coming to where you are. We don't expect you to come to where we are. I feel that it's needed to shine the light on the darknesses down here. So I can rise again. Now say it like you mean it, I've got... There's a shock factor to just witnessing and absorbing the physical trauma of what's happening on the streets. I see a lot of people in their addiction. My heart goes out to them because I was there. I come from a, a history of homelessness for over 30 some years, drug addiction for like 25 years. What I did for my addiction was the drum. I'm gonna make it. Yeah, I'm gonna make it. I made a mantra and I made it. And I'd just like to share some of the stuff that I've done. Music is a good way to express emotions that can be as abstracted as you want to. Or you can be completely open and completely vulnerable and that's, and that's great too. We will never fully back the major reform that is necessary if we don't have a vested interest in the community. The best way we can do that is by creating authentic relationships, which is what we're here to do. When we get together, we share the love through everything we got. A lot of the magic happens in listening to each other, hearing the music that we each produce, and then hearing how they combine together. I come in completely open. I've never rehearsed with them. I have no idea what we're playing. I literally bring a drum and use my ears to, to tell me what to say. The dance, the rhythm, the drumming, it's all part of bringing people together. We're humans trying to connect with other humans, and so when we're able to co-create this in a you know, singular moment that is fleeting in time, that's what makes what we do special. The bar barriers are coming down, you know? They are coming down. Change really is in this one-on-one -on -one relationship and just showing up to listen and to share and to celebrate. There is excellence down here, there's brilliance down here, and there's love down here. One of the first times we ever went to Skid Row with a group of singers, um, we performed music um, that ended in a, in a beautiful, glorious motet 
by Bach for eight singers and, and four um, string players. But before we performed the Bach, the singers actually did a, a folk song set. And as they were singing Shenandoah, um, a woman walked into the day room of the Midnight Mission shelter. And it was the middle of summer in Los Angeles. The asphalt was burning. And this lady walked in, and she clearly could care less about the music. She just wanted a place to sit down. And she was clutching um, a towel to her chest, and she was heaving her breath. And she sat in the back of this room, and I just kind of watched her. And I wondered what the hell we were doing there. I wondered what it meant to make music for such a traumatized, disenfranchised, hurting community when so often we're asked, well, why don't you give food? Why don't you give shelter? Why don't you give clothing? Why aren't you doing something that's more responsible? Why don't you organize for policy change? And then the singers started singing a song called Wana Baraka, which is a song in Swahili. And I was just blown away by the virtuosity and beauty of my colleagues who were singing with such vibrancy and joy. And I looked over and I had to do a double take because the woman who had just walked in, who happened to be black, was singing every single word of Wana Baraka in Swahili. And she had transformed, she lit up. She had this glowing smile on her face and it was as if she had taken a shroud off of herself. She was absolutely gorgeous. And she you know, stood up and she kind of started swaying and doing that two-step that often you see in African traditions. And after we finished, I walked up to her and I said, who are you? What's your story? And she said that she had come to LA from Tanzania. Her parents had emigrated. She had tried to go to school. She missed a couple of rent checks. Uh, she started seeing a guy who wasn't really good to her. And so she started living in a halfway home in Compton. And then um, the halfway home in Compton closed down. And so she ended up living in Skid Row. But what she said to me that was so much more important than this sad story was that she never expected to come to Skid Row and to hear her language. And that for me was so incredibly significant because what was being restored in that moment wasn't just um, a pathway towards entertaining her, but as a pathway towards establishing her identity, reestablishing a lifeline where she was connected to her culture and to her ancestors and she was grounded in her knowledge of herself. I mentioned before that Skid Row is a drop-off point for people emerging from, from incarceration in Los Angeles County, and I'd like to share another program with you that we do called Music for Change, and uh, we'll queue up the next video. Um, this program takes place in Skid Row at a center called the Weingart Center, which is the largest reentry service provider in Southern California. They offer 270 beds over three state and county contracts for people, um, both men and women, but mostly men emerging from short sentences in county jail all the way up to being paroled from life sentences in state prison. And this is Music for Change. Where you are today is the result of about eight weeks of conversation uh, and relationship building and community building, our participants performing with Street Symphony through Music for Change. I believe that this is the most important work that Street Symphony gets to do in this community. We've been part of the Skid Row community for about eight years now, but we've never had a conversation that has involved such intentional clinical guidance. And so with that, I'd like to bring up Mick, who's going to share some of his work with us. People that know me, they know me as Mickey. And uh, I feel real fortunate today because six months ago, I was sitting within prison. Um, doing a lot of writing in my cell, reflecting, and it shows up in a lot of my poetry. And I'm feeling real fortunate to be amongst uh, all you guys and uh, being able to share my piece. Now I had become so comfortable within that madness, it was as if I had gone to college. In the dysfunction, I had gotten a degree. 
My name is Corey. I'm recently released. I've been out roughly four months. Right. I am a ex-lifer. I'm going to be doing a poem that I wrote. It's called Senses of Addiction. I struggled with addiction for 20 years of my life. Corey and I have uh, collaborated on this project. A couple weeks ago, I offered a piece of music called Sep Papillon, which translates to Seven Butterflies. And we talked about how a butterfly, in order to transform from a caterpillar to a butterfly, literally needs to engouge itself, eat itself up inside a cocoon, and to be, to be reborn as a butterfly. And we, we, we talked about topics of the redemption and healing in that kind of context. Um, afterwards, Corey came up to me and said, I want to set my poems to this music. And listening to his words has actually completely shifted and changed the way I view this piece and view myself as a cellist. So I want to thank Corey for letting me share this moment with him. It's the scent of vinegar only I can smell. I can see my reflection in the steel. With each cut, the pain seeps away. I went to prison for 30 years and 44 days. Fortunately, at the same time, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilita Rehabilitation was coming on board with some rehabilitative programs. I took full advantage of that. As I, as I say, a light came on for me and I followed that light. And down the via, in the Larosa, in Jerusalem, that day. And down the via, in the Larosa, called the way of suffering. Like a lamb, came the Messiah. If someone else right. agrees or disagrees, that means that I concern me. Because this ain't about no one else. It's about me setting my own mind, heart, body free. And though I've used other unhealthy methods in the past, today, I just choose to use poetry. This is a place to transition, not just from a cell to a room to a, an apartment somewhere, but to transition from who you were and undo the monster that you had become and step up and take your divine and rightful place and move into the future with dignity. For that, I am grateful. I'm so struck by Duane's words at the end, this word around transition. Not just to move from a cage and a cell to just another room. You know, so often when we talk about homelessness and, and housing first, really we're also talking about out of sight, out of mind. Um, in a lot of the work that we do, we often grapple with this word outreach or charity. Because charity and outreach, although incredibly beautiful uh, initiating factors, still maintain the relationship of us and them. That one day I get to leave. I've done my good work for the year. I've done my good work for the season. But that now I'm going to go back to my life. And so outreach still kind of allows us to remain behind this professional veneer of our fourth wall. And as we started to make music in Skid Row, we started to meet people like Corey and Mick and Dwayne, who you saw in this video, and Ray, who you saw in the previous video. And when we would play for our audiences in Skid Row, they would ask us questions. They would undo the fourth wall. They wouldn't engage us in whatever nonsense beliefs we had about how good we sounded. Um, they kind of changed the narrative around what really mattered. And what mattered to them in that moment is they wanted to know our stories. They wanted to know who we were. They wanted to know why they should care about Beethoven, because clearly they could see that we cared about Beethoven. And so as we've done this work, we've moved from this place of charity and outreach into a far more mutual place of engagement and ultimately exchange. When we think about the words culture and cultivation and collaboration, they all have the same Latin root, which is C-O-L, col, which means together. And when we build cultures together, we're able to create a new sense of identity which belongs to all of us. 
So the last video I'd like to show you is uh, of a project that we do at the end of every year in Skid Row called the Messiah Project. Now, many of you may know Handel's Messiah as one of the most gloriously overperformed pieces of classical music in existence. Um, the Hallelujah Chorus is sung every single holiday season. But what you may not know is that the Messiah was actually first written in 1741 by Handel uh, at a time when he was um, going absolutely broke. Uh, he was a, a German immigrant writing Italian opera living in London, and there was a shift in the political uh, winds in London in, in the UK in the, in the 1740s. Um, and so Handel actually found himself without a job. No one wanted to present his music. And he had had a stroke, he was going blind, and he was actually facing debtor's prison. And so at one point, he received the text of the Messiah. Uh, and he, in this, in this kind of, I think, spiritual fervor, wrote the entire Messiah in a very short period of time, but couldn't find a venue in London. And so the Messiah was premiered in uh, Dublin in 1741 and the performance was so successful that not only did Handel pay off all of his own debts, he released 142 men from debtor's prison. He paid off all of their debts. And so there is a long history of connection and social justice in the music of the Messiah. But when the performances happened in London, they also didn't happen in a fancy concert hall or cathedral. They happened in an, in a, in an orphan's hospital, the Foundlings Hospital. And so we had the idea of presenting the Messiah uh, in Skid Row, similarly to the, the, the same philosophy and spiritual calling that Handel wrote the piece to begin with. So this is our Messiah project. in the center of one of the largest and most creative American cities. We have tens of thousands of people who live in tents. I'm angry that a place like Skid Row exists. People who are talented, resilient, who deserve to have their voices heard are silenced by structural inequality and systemic racism. And in my mind, the artist's role is to serve as a bridge. When you hear somebody singing or playing an instrument, it's coming from their soul. It's coming from their heart. And it's reaching out to others. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute honor to welcome you to this third Messiah Project. We are presenting excerpts of Handel's beloved Messiah alongside a series of pieces of music which tell the story of people who experience homelessness and poverty in Los Angeles today. Our goal is to share our stage with the Skid Row community. This is the first year of the launch of the Street Symphony Fellows program. And this year, Ben Shirley is our composer fellow. Ben is such a special person to have as our first composition fellow because he is both a professional musician and a member of the Skid Row community. We're going to premiere a brand new piece of Ben's that we have commissioned ourselves called We Need Darkness to See the Stars. came down here from drugs and alcohol and now it's come full circle and just overwhelming. I've got this wide open, endless music to study and listen to and explore and it's been my lifesaver. Hopefully some of the guys at the mission will look and say, if this idiot can do it, I can get my life to be better. We also have vocalist fellows who are performing this year, Brian Palmer and our mezzo-soprano, Christina Collier. The people that walk it, that walk it in darkness. The piece that I'm singing is The People That Walked in Darkness. For me, this piece is like the phoenix rising. The people that when I came here three years ago, I had a month clean from a heroin addiction. So today I celebrate 
the resilience of your ever-expanding souls. And I pray that you see the light inside you and give it permission to shine. Homelessness and drug addiction are just conditions. They're not really who we are. This is huge. Like, I've never done anything like this before. I am a Skid Row resident. Never in a million years did I think that I would be singing along with members of the LA Phil and the Master Chorale. The song, He Shall Feed His Flock Like a Shepherd, it makes me feel like I want to take everyone in my arms and just give them a big hug and let them know that, you know, everything's going to be all right. Today's a new day! Everyone on Skid Row came from somewhere. It's not right that there's human beings sleeping on the sidewalks. And I'm going to continue to use my voice to tell people about what's going on. It's up to us to cause that awareness shift from cynicism and complacency to empathy and community. If I can just touch one heart today, then mission accomplished. I celebrate the resilience of your ever-expanding souls. And I pray that you see the light within you and give it permission to shine. Brian passed away last week. And it was such a shock to us. Um, because for so many reasons, we looked up to him as our guide, as our mentor, as our success story. Um, Brian started working construction uh, in LA County and almost had landed himself a contractor job. And as devastated as we are by his passing, we're also reminded that he claimed us and we were able to claim him. You know, in this work, we are obsessed with redemption stories. We're obsessed with stories like my colleague Ben who actually was at the mission and then became our composer in residence and now actually has a full-time job at Street Symphony. But not every single story is like that. We're not as good as our best moments and we're not as bad as our worst ones. And so the work of Street Symphony is not to show up to fix anyone, to heal anyone, to redeem anyone or to redeem ourselves, but rather to continue to show up in this message of connection. Because connection now is justice in the future, however we define it. And alienation and disconnection from ourselves and from our world now is a profound injustice in the future. And I think about the words of Eli Wiesel, who said that the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference and the opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. And the opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. And so the work of Street Symphony and the work of this sweet human connection that we strive to build is about ending apathy. We will never drive past an individual pushing a shopping cart or sleeping in a tent in Skid Row and not wonder what their story was. But again, as I said, this, mu this, this talk is not just about healing the world through music and art. It's also about paying attention to the places where we are indifferent to our own suffering, where we are indifferent to our own pain. I believe that we ostracize and criminalize the most fragile and vulnerable members of our society because we are indifferent 
and apathetic to the parts within ourselves with, which ache and hurt. And so I believe that we need the arts now more than ever as a public health intervention, as a mental health intervention, as a way for our lives to catch up with our souls. And whether your craft is practicing the violin for several hours a day, or studying, or writing budgets, or being the most incredible administrative assistant you can, or playing sports. Your life is your work of art. Your life is your constant daily prayer, your constant mutual offering towards your creator. To be able to hold up a mirror to this incredible, painfully, achingly sweet miracle of creation and to commit ourselves every single day to continue to show up, to not only see the world outside us, but to see and cherish the world within ourselves. And so it is in that connection where we soften from this place of viewing each other as the stranger or as the other to this place of empathy where we see my pain as your pain and your joy as my joy. We give ourselves permission to shine. I'd like to close with one last story. In the Messiah Project video, you saw a man who was wiping tears from his eyes. And that was actually his first day at the shelter. And every, every year before Messiah Project and after, we actually go out to the street with uh, several hundred hygiene kits. There's little amenity bags filled with shampoos and soap and deodorants and feminine hygiene products and toothbrushes and that kind of thing. And we kind of try to get people to come into, uh, into our audience and, and experience the, the Messiah Project with us. And, and as we started to do this um, kind of canvassing outreach, we met this man. And he said to us something along the lines, uh, in Spanish, he said something along the lines of, I don't want to hear that gringo music. And so we kind of laughed and we said, well, you know, if you want to come, you're more than welcome to come. And we didn't tell him that we start our Messiah project with a 30 minute set from Las Colibri, which is the all women mariachi ensemble. And so they started singing, the mariacheras started singing, and so this man came up, um, he was sitting in the back of the room, very reluctantly, he did not want to be there. And the women started singing a song called Guantanamera. Uh, it means girl from Guantanamo. And this man, similar to my, my colleague, my friend, who lit up when she heard Juana Baraka, he stood up and he put his fist in the air. And he started singing every single word of the Sandpiper's song, Guantanamera. And as the mariacheras left and we started playing the music of Handel, this man walked up to Hasmin, our, our, our lead violinist, and she kind of, he kind of grabbed her by the shoulders and he said, how did you know to play my song? How did you know to play my music? You saw me. I haven't heard that song since I left Cuba 30 years ago. I never thought I'd have to come here in order to hear my music. So as we continue to make our lives together, as we continue to lean into this sweetness, may we also continue to see each other and give ourselves permission to shine. Thank you very much. So I know that we have a, a Q&A in a little bit. Um, I would love to offer you some more music if I could uh, with the, just the remaining few minutes that I have. Um, I'd like to um, actually get all of you to sing. Um, the whole point of being a performer is that I get to open very vulnerable doors. Yeah, see, there, everyone's leaving. I was just, just like <laughs> heading out the door. Um, I'd like to uh, share with you a piece of music that is also written by Rina. Um, and it was written in the vernacular of Skid Row. It was written in collaboration with um, a choir in Skid Row called the Urban Voices Project. You saw them performing several times in the videos. Um, Brian was a member of Urban Voices Project. And this piece is called Take What You Need. And what I'd like to do uh, first is quickly grab my violin, so hang on.
I'd like to speak the words to you of this song, and I'd like you to speak them back to me. And then I'm going to play the song on my violin, and then we're going to sing together. Okay? Deal? No, I need far more than that. Deal? <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. Take a moment. Take a breath. Take time. Take care. Take heart. Take hope. Take a step. Take a chance. Take courage. Take charge. Take a stand. Take pride. Take joy. Take pause. Take a moment. Take a breath. Take what you need. Take what you need. Take what you need. Beautiful. 